<coughs> so, thank you very much for the previous speakers. And now we will go on to another quite basic subject. And to begin with, I would like to ask all of you here, when was the last time that you really learned anatomy? Please just shout out, when, how long has it been? Six years. Six years. Yesterday. Yesterday. Someone else? Two days, okay. For me, it's been two years. So you see, there's a lot of differences in, in like, we're quite a heterogeneous group. So I will introduce someone to you who will bring us all to the same level. And this one is, this person is someone quite, quite known to the local students here. And he's someone that we are already having here for the fourth time. And so please help me in welcoming our next speaker, Dr. Georg Feidel. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction. As the grad students already know me, uh, I'm the bad boy of the Department of Anatomy, uh, bringing you some gray hairs uh, during your studying. But anyway, you will see uh, today it's an absolutely different uh, topic, not only we're talking about, but also a different approach concerning anatomy, what you learned uh, several years ago or to yesterday or today. Um, well, as you know, it, you learn in regularly the systematic anatomy in your courses, or mainly focus on that. In the uh, lectures also, you just watch um, the dissections, you, you try to get an access in the lectures or also in the anatomical textbooks, you always have one section of an organ. But nevertheless, the approach uh, in the clinical fields are absolutely different. And that's why we have uh, today, we, cho we choose uh, three different topics, uh, starting with the abdominal, abdominal cavity, that's the first one. Uh, second would be uh, focusing on the heart, with uh, sections of the heart, what you need uh, for the ultrasound. And if we uh, still have some time left, uh, we might go to the pelvic area. Uh, anyway, th this is also very important as we learned uh, an hour ago, but nevertheless, uh, I still want to chose the first other two topics uh, before coming to the pelvic area. Another important uh, message for you as I'm dealing with uh, ultrasound since now about 15 years, not with the fast ultrasound, not with the emergency uh, approaches, procedures, but more or less, as you know, uh, from my let's say it's a scientific field, uh, the regional anesthetic purposes and, and backgrounds. Uh, ultrasound is a wonderful tool to play with and to deal with. The problem is, as we learned, uh, is how to manage uh, these manual skills and especially that you're interpreting uh, the images correctly. And this is one of the most important topics uh, currently also in the scientific fields, that the machines are getting better with each day. That's the first part. And the problem is the, the images are getting better too. So when the machine is getting better, the images get, are getting better, we know or we see structures what we haven't described before as an anatomist. And this is something which will be a problem in the next future years, upcoming years, because especially in, in the high frequency ultrasound, let's say we're dealing with the 22 or 23 megahertz uh, probes, we see structures never seen before. And this is something which is uh, absolutely incredible now, as we talked about the vis visibility of nerves, for example. Uh, well, the femoral nerve, it's like that size in the screen now. And we're dealing with the small nerves, like, for example, uh, the cervical branch of the facial nerve. And it's like that, with a diameter of half a centimeter in the, screen, in the screenshot. So this is something what we're dealing with already. And you can imagine a structure uh, of a tissue component of a fascia is now 
absolutely well visible, but nevertheless the anatomical description is not comparable or not the same as what you see on the screens. So this is a little bit this, this wonderful uh, approach to ultrasound. Nevertheless, you need a training, 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 and the problem is that you not only need training, you need this anatomical knowledge about it. If you uh, deal with ultrasound, you do not need only the systematic anatomy. You, know, you have to know the topographical anatomy, and unfortunately, most of the medical schools or universities, there is not very much time left to bring you this topographic anatomy because uh, time is reduced, especially also in the dissection hours and also with the lectures. So you have to uh, deal it with it on your own. You have to learn this topographic anatomy and especially then with the background the clinical anatomy too. So what we are dealing with today is a, the topo topographic anatomy approach and absolutely, I'm sure that you already know the systematic of the heart, so I don't, I don't, don't need to repeat this. So let's start with the abdominal cavity first and then going, or going on with the heart. So just a little bit, the abdominal cavity. Okay, do we see this? Yep, it's working. Abdominal cavity, you know this? Oops. Um, I, will, I will make a, you don't need to write this, or to draw this, you will get the originals <laughs> as a copy. Yeah, the, you get a PDF file of that, so you don't need this, okay? Just lean your back, enjoy the flight with anatomy. Excuse for my accent, but you know, this, this is a Styrian accent. Um, fortunately, not of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Okay, what about this abdominal cavity? We, we do not need the entire cavity because, uh, you know, the bowels have the problems with the, the air in it. So what we are focusing all, uh, on is now the upper part. Uh, we have the liver and also the organs. Uh, like stomach and also the, the spleen or the, and let's make a short overview about these um, organs and then try to make some cross sections and especially the cross sections you need to uh, get to um, the very important visibility of Carlos pouch and Morrison's pouch. So what you have over here first of all is of course the liver which is the incredible huge organ, uh, and then of course the stomach, which is unfortunately regularly filled with air, so one of the major trouble makers in your area also with the duodenum running down, and then you have this C form of the duodenum running back again and going to this point where you have the turnaround and then continuing into the urinal. Um, and then you see in this area already, you get the gallbladder, which was absolutely well visible on, on our student. But you can imagine if I would lie up there, yeah, with my wonderful fat tissue, uh, you get some troubles. And you already know this in, in one of the first. Uh, Sona for you sessions where I had this wonderful student I could uh, make the, the uh, ultrasound on and then we turned around so okay you can do it now on my own and that was the difference absolutely cool uh, very well visible so you, you can uh, join this YouTube because it's it's not only see the difference but also feel the difference and unfortunately if you have a patient in your time in hospital, you won't find the very skinny guys and ladies, but somebody like me. And even, okay. 
more heavy weighted <laughs> with a higher body mass index. So this is something what you have to deal with and it's increasing. And therefore this sauna for you is absolutely great because you can train on with the very first steps. You can uh, train the easy access, you can train these manual skills and then increase your experience always with the heavy weighted um, paper. So that's absolutely fantastic to train. Okay, let's go over here, the gallbladder. Go back and then of course we need the colon running up and you know the, uh, over here the colon with the col ascending colon and then going to the transverse colon yeah, which is crossing around over here going up you know on the left side it's a little bit much more cranial and over here this is the transverse colon running up. So there is one important organ missing, which is of course the spleen over here. And therefore I could take another color for the spleen, running over here. And of course this is the systematic view, okay, this is the spleen over there. But this is not the correct position of course, because regularly it's a little bit oblique. Nevertheless, this is the abdominal cavity concerning the peritoneal cavity. But we still need one organ which is more uh, dorsally located and that's the kidney. And for the kidney I take uh, light brown. As you know the kidney are just backside over here. Would be like uh, in this area. You know that the medial margin of the kidney is reaching the duodenum and then running down and also on the other side you have the kidneys and you know that the left kidney is much more cranial than the right one because of the liver on the right side. So you have the kidneys just a little bit more cranial. So nevertheless we, we see that there are different organs in the systematical overview but nevertheless we, we need now the cross sections and also a transverse section because this is not only the important part to see the organs but also the peritoneal cavity and especially these pouches. The recesses in there in the area and the peritoneal uh, spaces which might be filled with liquids, with any liquids. Yeah? There doesn't need to be an hemorrhage or blood in there but also some other uh, fluids. Okay, so this is the overview. Let's make now first a transverse section over here. It's a little bit of an oblique section, like that. Okay, let's make it like that. A, a transverse section over here. But including also the peritoneum now. So just keep this in mind. We can go back to that. And of course we need first of all the spine, you see in the lumbar area the spine is really prominent to the ventral part. So on the upper part this is dorsal, so it's absolutely quite clear and we make a simplification. This would be now the abdominal wall, turning around over here, going to the ventral, lateral and then ventral abdominal wall with the muscles. and. Of course this is spine area, lumbar spine. And first of all we need the kidneys. Okay, kidney one. See also this little um, crease over here. The fat tissue which is absolutely well visible in ultrasound too. So this is kidney. Okay, kidney. Then of course mid part. Aorta. Inferior cable vein over here. At the net the important part anyway. And now we need the peritoneum. And the peritoneum is, you know, with the parietal, parietal peritoneum very close to the kidney. Over here too. Now let's turn around. Ventral abdominal wall. Going back. You see, so we're here then going to this area. And now 
which is also very well visible, the liver as the first organ. Over here, this is the liver. The rest of the liver we can take over here. And a little bit of colon still. A little bit of colon. So it's the, the right flexura, what we call, where it's turning around. Okay. Then we need the stomach. Stomach would be a little bit in the cross section like that. So stomach, liver, of course. Oops. It's not a real steroid liver, you know. Regularly the steroid liver is a little bit larger, a little bit fattier because of the alcohol. Yeah, today a friend of mine, he's, who is an anesthetist, called me just before Sona for you and said, uh, would you join me to go down to the vineyard? So he said, no, I'm sorry, I have to work. Oh, Jesus, you bloody hell. You're so, I'm so sorry for you. I said, no, no, I have some fun over there. So have you fun with your alcohol. <laughs> I'm dealing with, it, with, with you, and it's absolutely much better because I enjoy it very much indeed to be over here. Um, so this is the spleen. Rips S. Okay. And now with the peritoneum. First of all, you know that the... Over here, you have this fixation of the colon in this area. Then you get the liver with the peritoneum just running around. There is no so-called mesohepaticum ventrale, the fixation of the liver because you are a little bit lower uh, than, you have, uh, than the uh, mesos are. But anyway, you have this meso over here going to the gaster, or to the stomach. Then another going to the spleen and turning around. And now, which is very important, this is going to the area of the aorta. So you see that this is running to the aorta and then being fixed over here. So you get now, and this is uh, a very important part in this area, a very huge cavity a very huge cavity over here, which is regularly called the so-called romantal bursa. Yeah? Romantal bursa, which is a, a cavity which has regularly not very much space in it. You do not see it really in ultrasound. But if you get a bleeding from the stomach or also from the spleen in the dorsal areas, or in the medial areas, this is filled. And then the so-called potential cavity will be filled with the liquid, with your blood. The problem is that you can fill this cavity with two liters, and then the, these two liters are missing somewhere. So without any troubles, this can be filled. So this is the first area. The second, it might, if you have a bleeding into the omental bursa, this might run out, and you see this might run out over here to the right side. We have now a pouch in between the kidney and the liver, and the kidney, the colon, and the liver. So you have two pouches, one and two, or so-called recess, over here. What you have just in this area, and one is the so-called recessus in Latin, hepatorenalis, hepatorenalis. So that means in between the kidney and the liver, which is the so-called Morrison pouch. Yeah? So this is the first area where the liquids are absolutely concentrated and being located and also visible. So this is Morrison. And the very interesting thing is that we always, always learned that Morrison is number two. So in between the liver, the kidney, and the colon. Anyway, it's the same space, yeah? So it doesn't matter, you're just a little bit more on the right side. So two would be 
also a recess, but now with Hepato, Reno, Colicus. So one organ more. Who cares? It's the same, just a little bit more white. Hmm. Okay. Nevertheless, you know from, from this examin examines, well, what we did, oh, yeah, you have to know this. Okay. You see, it's not that, that, that great problem. But that's the point of the anatomist. We tease you. Yeah? We love this job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's go back. So, omental bursa. Potential cavity, bleedings or anything can go to recess number one and recess number two. Okay, what is on the other side? What is on the left side? On the left side you see, well, there is the abdominal or the peritoneal cavity in this area. Well, if you lie down a patient, he would be not lying on the, on the stomach, on his belly, but he's lying on the, on the, on the back. So, or left or right side. So this is a very important part. If you turn the patient on the right side, you will see quite easily any liquids over here. If you turn the patient on the other side, the liquid will be uh, visible in the, on the left side, of course. So, liquid will turn around and run into the area of the spleen, and then also a little bit being dorsally. So in between the kidney and the spleen. Nevertheless, this is peritoneal cavity, okay? But this is the so-called collar's pouch. So this would be collar now. Okay. So this is collar. This is a very important part because over here, this is not only a potential cavity, but it's an absolutely very important cavity. What you know when you dissect it and you had this uh, the examine about the peritoneal cavity because to find this area, you have to move your entire and to break him just dorsally to the spleen, and then the entire uh, arm was until the area of your elbow in the peritoneal cavity. And this is also if you have an emergency access, for example, uh, concerning a bleeding or hemorrhage of the spleen, you can stop the bleedings directly because the splenic artery is running in this meso to reach the spleen. So if you turn around and then move like that with the uh, thumb and also the index, just to press on, you get the stop of the um, blood supply of the spleen. And then you can move the spleen out. So this is an emergency access from the surgical point of view. Anyway, if you put another probe over here, let's say on the left side, yeah? so that not the linear scan would be like that. Of course, curved array, because with the linear array, uh, linear array you wouldn't see anything except of a very skinny student. Then, okay. So, you get the scan like that, and then you can see Collar's pouch quite easily. But there is one little problem. This is something what I learned when I had to do uh, these ultrasounds, also uh, during my time in the hospital for half a year. Yeah, that was, that was because of the specialization. An anatomist has also to work in the hospital. That was very interesting. Still living patient. <laughs> Problem, he has to still live afterwards too. Okay. Also an anesthesia. Bing, bing, bing. Oh, what's that? I know the flat line. Okay, let's go over here. The spleen, that's, that's the easy way. It's, what's the problem to take a look on the, on the spleen? Oh yeah, there are some problems. Because you know that the spleen is just located at the area of the 10th rib. So you get a bone in between your array and your spleen. So that's why you need absolutely the intercostal space. And this is... A, the quite tricky tool then, to get this absolutely window to see both of them 
kidney and spleen in this area. And I think you get some, this image over here. No. Okay, doesn't matter. Okay, let's ma make now a sagittal section, just for a better overview, a better understanding. Let's make it like that. This is now another one, S1. Over here, where you get the liver and also the kidneys and the colon. <coughs> so, move on. We get now the peritoneal cavity, the abdominal cavity with the diaphragm over here. Then you get the liver, huge liver. Whoops, okay, with the inferior margin. This would be the liver over here. Again. Now the kidney on the back side, dorsally, of course. Light brown. And now just a little bit on the very right side, the colon. So the colon was in green. Make the colon over here. And the peritoneal cavity is now like that. Did you get the peritoneum going down over here, turning around, and over here also on the kidneys, and you know that it's also just around over here about the colon. So this is now the, these, this pouch, what you have, which is one or two. And you see this is absolutely the same space. So everything what is collected or located over here, it will be visible in between these three or two organs. So this is Morrison, okay? Let's make it like that. This is Morrison. And this is a very important part. So it's, it's getting up quite well uh, to the cranial areas and also will run downwards if you have a standing position. So this is also very important that the entire peritoneal cavity, of course, has another location where liquids can be collected and be visible, which is, would be in the pelvic area. So this is the upper abdomen, as you see it over here, and also the area of uh, the Morrison and Collar's pouch. Okay, let's go now to the heart. And the heart sections <coughs> are absolutely quite interesting. When I learned the first time, well, you have to do the heart sections. And I came over here and I just watched you as a student, as students. I was absolutely amazed concerning your knowledge already. It was really incredible, especially the tutors, with the easiest way, oh, you have to turn the array, the probe, like that, 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 poof, 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 poof. One chamber after the other. It was just, <clears throat> okay. So I went back to my department and said, okay, I have to learn this too. Okay, let's try it now. Let's make an approach, a very different approach. Neck, okay. With the clavicle over here. Of course, this is the thorax going down, just a very fast one. And you know, would be over here, this is the thorax. And now the area of the diaphragm where the heart is, the heart is located. And now the problem is that we need the topography of the heart which means that you have this left positioned or left side positioned organ over here with the apex, a peak. Yeah? And now it's just the next problem that you have bony parts just in front of it with the sternum and the ribs. So you need to find uh, an approach to this heart in this area. And you know, okay, if we do it a little bit more cordially, 
doesn't matter, but you can make it from underneath or through uh, the, the area, let's say, it, of the intercostal spaces. You can make it parasternally, you can try to get the approach from the peak, or you can try to make a cross-section. So these approaches are. But nevertheless, you have to think about which chambers, with, uh, which um, parts of the heart you will see in which cross-section, what you make in the heart. And therefore, we need the, the, the uh, topography of the heart itself. So first of all, we need the surfaces. What surfaces do we have? What, do, what will we see and what will we cut with our probe? So let's make it like that. Which surfaces do we have? Surfaces. Well, the first one is, of course, the sternocostal phase. <coughs> sternocostal phase, which is the, the ventral phase. Then we have the lateral phase, not very useful. The dorsal phase or posterior one. Uh, well, well, that would you use if you make an ultrasound via the esophagus. Okay, also possible, but not for an emergency procedure. <laughs> Imagine that you have to put down the ultrasound first in the esophagus and then like, oh, let's just keep, calm down, calm down. Okay, that would take too long. So we need especially the sternocostal phase and the peak. But what about the sternocostal phase? Okay, let's make it like that. Over here we have the super cable vein running down. Okay. Then we have the right atrium, auricle over here, right atrium. You know that over here this is going to the inferior margin of the heart, then it's turning around again, you see the right ventricle. Just in between, it's turning around and continuing with the pulmonary arteries. And just in, in the middle of the supracaval vein and the right atrium, right ventricle, you have in between the aorta. So visible, the aorta running upwards. I'm turning around. This is the aorta, ascending aorta, which is the continuation of the left ventricle. But the problem is on this view, this is the sternocostal uh, phase. Where is the right ventricle? And you know that the right ventricle, uh, left ventricle, sorry, is just a little bit more on the left side, forming the peak of the heart, the apex. And a little bit visible over here, wow. Left atrium with the auricle. Okay, here we get it. So left atrium, left ventricle. If we have now the parasternal view of the heart, this would not be in the middle part because you see over here, there would be the sternum running down. So if you go parasternally, you would have a view which is crossing over here like that. Which means, what do, you, what do you see then? Well, you will see, of course, right ventricle, left ventricle, and might be the aorta or not. Depends a little bit how oblique your probe will be, how the heart is located. What is if we do a cross-section? Well, if you do a cross-section, you see, oh, for example, over here, we will have the right ventricle and the left ventricle in our, our view. What is if we make a view from the subxifoidal area? So the probe would be over here, then you see, okay, you would, be have, you have, would have a scan where you find 
the right and the left ventricle first and then the right and the left atrium in the uh, deep of your image. And if you take the peak, you get the same. You get the probe over here. Well, let's make it with another color over here. And this would be your scan. So you see also it's starting with the left ventricle, then the right, and also the two atriums. So these two probe positions will give you an imagination of four so-called chambers. The two red ones, not. The red ones are focusing especially on the areas of the two ventricles. So these two, let's take it like parastandal one and two, one and two are especially for the ventricles. So you can see the ventricles quite easily, but not very much in the, the atriums. So it's for the ventricles. And blue and also pink, they are the so-called four chamber views. So these are the four chamber views. Okay, so let's try it now. Let's make the first section, parastandard view. What do we see then? Okay, I need now the, let's say, parastandard view. Still with me? Yeah. At that time, how, 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 what time is it? Half past eight. Pooh, Jesus. Ah, yeah, long day. <laughs> no, it's cool. Still focused. Okay, we need a sternum. Well, not, not the sternum. Let's say, let's make it the ribs. Okay, it's intercostal areas. Okay. And now the diaphragm. What do you see over here? Let's make it like that. Diaphragm. Yoo-hoo. And the heart. And now, in the parastandard view, you get first of all over here, this is the so-called right ventricle. Yeah? The right ventricle in this area. Especially when you have to probe in here in the scan, you get not only the right ventricle, but I'm coming back with my heart. It will be the outlet area. So the region where you go into the uh, pulmonary trunk and then continuing over here. So it would be this area where you get this scan, yeah, the right ventricle. And what is behind? Behind, you find the left ventricle, and especially then might be the aorta with the valve over here. And if you're lucky enough, you get over here, of course, the mitral valve with my, might be the atrium, the left atrium. But this is if you're lucky. So you see, it depends a little bit how the probe is positioned. Because, let's go back over here. If you turn slightly to the left side or turn slightly to the right side, this will entirely change your image. So it depends highly how the probe is positioned. And this is something what, they, what you have to train. Okay, so this is the parastandal view. What is now if we turn around 90 degrees? Of course you have a cross-section of this heart, so you will have a cross-section, which will be like that. So the so-called short axis. You will have the intercostal space with your probe, 
And now in the short axis, of course, a very, let's say like that, flat part of the right ventricle. And then the very thick muscle layers of the myocardial part of the left ventricle. And again, of course, in the left ventricle, you might find parts of the mitral valve, which are, of course, situated in the left ventricle. So this, is, this would be the scanning area. So you get first the right ventricle. Do you see the valves in there? For example, the tricuspidal valve? No, because, of course, you're in the outlet part of it. So again, the part which is continuing into the uh, pulmonary trunk. If you would have a four chamber areas of crud, of course, then you can see uh, the tricuspidal valve, but not in these two sections. So always you get the outlet areas, and of course, in this area, in the parasternal view, you get inlet and outlet of the left ventricle. But nevertheless, atrium well, hmm. not that easy to see. Of course, if you get now the perica pericardium over here, the per pericardi uh, pericardial cavity, this would be a cool view where you see blood in there. Same over here. So there would be a gap in between the sternum or the, let's say the chest wall and the right ventricle. So if you have a liquid, if you have blood in there, a tamponade, you will see this gap in between. Regularly it's quite close to the chest wall. Okay, so this is parasternal in the long axis and in the short axis. <coughs> and let's move on now to the subxifoidal and also to uh, the four chamber view. So the apical view, what I call it. Because you're coming from the peak of the heart, from the apex of the heart. Okay, let's move on. Um, let's do the hmm, subxifoidal, would be a good idea. So. Underneath the xiphoid, so sub xiphoidal view. So how can, how can you get this? Well, same over here. You will have, if we get back to our heart, we get now the view from underneath. So this would be the area of your probe with the scan. So you see now you're coming from caudal and the scan is going cranially. So what you have to find first are of course again the ventricles and then you have a view on the atriums. And in the view of course first would be the right ventricle so if we have again, over here, this would be the xiphoid or the chest wall. What do you see then? Again, with the probe, let's make it like that. Oh, let's make it like that. So probe, this would be the scan. So what do you find? You find, of course, first, over here, this would be the right ventricle. And then it's going to the right atrium. And two wharfs, leaflets, for example, running into the right ventricle. So this is the right atrium, the right ventricle, and this is the tricuspidal wharf in this area. And concerning the left part, you see over here, this would be now the myocardium of the left ventricle and then the left atrium on the very deepest part of your image. So the left atrium 
and the left ventricle again with might be the mitral valve. This is again from the median area. So if you put it, your probe underneath the xiphoid and then scanning cranially, you always see, of course, the right ventricle first. But what is if we turn now to the peak of the heart? Is there a change? Yes, there is. Because the peak of the heart is formed by the left ventricle. So if you turn around now, your area going to the peak, this will change. It will turn around. And you will see, of course, first the left ventricle and, uh, and then the right ventricle. So let's go back over here. So this would be now the so-called apical four chamber view from this point of view. And you see it would turn around, would be turned, and then you have the left ventricle and then the right ventricle on your view. So let's make this part two, the so-called apical four chamber view. By the way, four chambers, not correct. Chamber would be the ventricle only. And you see these definitions, this terminology is also not, not, not very correct. Oh, who cares? Names are sometimes for the graves, for nothing else. Okay. Four chamber view. So what do we have now? We have again the chest wall with the probe and the scanning sector. So what you have over here is of course first with a huge myocard, the left ventricle and again might be the mitral wharf with the left atrium. And then a little bit dorsally, you will find the right ventricle and over here the right atrium. <coughs> and again with the wharf. So you see this area with the apical four chamber view is changed. So the heart is turned, of course, as the topography has to be. So if we can match it like that, you see, mm, no, should be now switched horizontally. Not possible with, it, <laughs> with this drawing. So the left ventricle is always the more, the closest part to your array, to your probe and then it's going to the right way to clean this area. Okay. What can you see over there? Of course, again, the pericardial uh, cavity. So any liquid in there, you can see. Any distance in between the chest wall and the wall of the uh, surface of the heart, so the epicardium, would be visible. If you have a huge tamponade, of course, the distance would be absolutely much larger than with a smaller one. But then, if you have a huge gap, you can, of course, insert the needle quite easily. But one thing, <coughs> what you have to keep in mind, if you advance a needle and you get an array, which has a width, let's say, of two centimeters. <coughs> and you advance the needle in plane. You have always to take into account that if you have this scanning sector, that you have only a two-dimensional view of the needle. 
The needle could be over here, it could be right in the middle, or it could be on the other end of your sector scan. This is a distance of two centimeters. And this might explain, for example, if somebody is using ultrasound to insert a venflon into a small vein, that you see the vein, you see your venflon needle in, uh, entering the scanning sector, but, and you see the needle in running into the vein, but there is no blood coming. It can be the problem with your probe and your image because the vein would be here and the needle would be the other position. So you're passing. You are not in the vessel. The larger the vessel is, the easier it might be. The smaller the vessel is, the more problems you get. You see? Also not that easy. So you need a lot of experience with the smaller vessels. If you take the subclavian vein, okay, yeah, then there's no problem. Even over there, there are some problems. But then, again, there is something coming back into our account. It's not the problem of the probe. It's the problem of the user. You know this on your own when you play with your computer at home. The computer made always tick, tick, tick. Mainly, you are the problem. You are, you are causing the problem. And therefore, the regional anesthetists always say, whatever you have as an ultrasound machine, if it costs 20,000 euros or 125 or 225,000 euros, we are dealing with thousands, of course, yeah? Not 225 euros. That would be great, huh? I would take every, all the machines. Um, but you can say a fool with a tool remains a fool. And that's the problem. So you see, it's not easy. Okay. And I, I, I always think back on my own. When I, I started with ultrasound, it was, it was a major disaster, really. I always took, say, I don't see anything. And I, you have to get used to the images. You have to get used to all the structures you see. You have to turn around and then maybe also dealing with a needle and both together and then looking on the screen, not on the patient. Oh, oh. Taking time, taking training taking time and taking training again. Incredible, really. But you get experience with each day. That's one important thing and that's absolutely the great thing. Okay, so I hope you get these uh, different images. I see it's not the easy way over here, but nevertheless again, you reach or you see the right ventricle first, then left, and if you take the apical four chamber view, it's turning around left ventricle first and then right ventricle. So it's really a turnaround. Okay. Still some time left? How many? Uh, 15. Oh, that's cool. Let's go to the pelvic area. Goody. <coughs> pelvic area. Of course, we have to uh, think about the two sexes. Male and female, pelvic area are different, of course, because there are some organs missing uh, in the pelvic area in a male uh, pelvic girdle. So let's take first female, and then going to the male. Female is the absolutely much more interesting one. However you might interpret this now. <laughs> was not my, my, my fault. It's your, your thoughts, not mine. From the anatomical point of view, of course, because there are more pouches, more recesses, so much more to tease you. Always this point of view. Okay, let's make a 
sagittal section. Okay? Because you, of course, have to put the probe in a sagittal position, median sagittal position just uh, above the symphysis, and then turn around to make a cross section. So anyway, you have to deal with uh, the sagittal section first. Okay, let's make it like that. You have over here the sacrum. You say, okay, I don't need the sacrum in this area, but anyway, we need it over here. Then you have the pelvic uh, surface or pelvic face. Then running over here, going to the symphysis. Abdominal wall. Over here. I'm not dealing with the subcutaneous fat tissue over here. Pelvic floor, for sure, just make it over here. And now the organs. First of all, the rectum, over here. Running down with the turn, you know this convexity to the dorsal part. Flexura sacralis cord, then flexura perinealis running down in this area, okay. Then you have the uterus, over here, regularly well visible, with the antiflexion, over here, vagina, running down, and then the bladder, urinary bladder, of course, with the urethra running down, okay. These are the organs. That doesn't help us that much because we need the peritoneum. And you know that the peritoneum is running down on the ventral abdominal wall. Then have a small recess over here going a little bit more cordial in between the bladder. This is the urinary bladder. It's the uterus and the rectum. Running a little bit more cordial, turning around again, and then you have in between the uterus and the rectum a very deep space, deep cavity. And this is the absolutely most cordial point of the peritoneal cavity, the most cordial point. So you have two opportunities where the liquid might be located. One, in between the urinary bladder and the uterus, and of course two, in between the rectum and the uterus. And you know that one is a so-called excavatio, or cavity, excavatio, Vesico, uterina, which means um, vesico uterine, uterine cavity or space. Not the most caudal one, but anyway, also an opportunity where liquids can be located and visible. But of course, number two is much more important because it's in between uterus and rectum, so excavatio recto uterina, and that's the so-called cavum douglasi, yeah? or Douglas space, or Douglas excavatio, or whatever. Is it called Douglas, by the way? Yeah. Yes, yeah. you call it Douglas, pouch of Douglas, okay. Because we call it douglasi. Yeah. No idea why, <laughs> I'm sorry. But, but you, you know these problems with the synonyms, yeah? Uh, like, for example, Chopin, yeah? Chopin's joint gap. The Germans would say Copart, for example. Or Lis Franc, he, he was French. The Lis France, yeah? Okay, Douglas Pouch. Okay, so these two. If we make a cross-section now, 
So if you turn around, this is, would be the sagittal section. Okay, not in this point of view, but you have to turn it around. Down there, then you have it. Okay? So you just have to turn it now, 90 degrees, and you get your <coughs> wonderful probe. Probe would be over here, scanning sector. Voila. Yeah? But the problem is now the cross section. So we have to turn back again. Let's make the cross section. Over here, this is the abdominal wall. Yeah? Then you would have the bladder over here, urinary bladder, the uterus, UT, and then the rectum. And over here, of course, this would be now Douglas pouch, so number two, and might be a little bit number one. Okay? So therefore, if you have the scan, in the cross section, you got Douglas pouch just in between uterus and rectum, quite really in the deep of your image. And over there, you will have uh, the fluids in there, quite well visible. <coughs> what about the male? Uh, yeah, there's something missing. Let's make the male now, which is the final part. Okay, again, okay, male, sorry, of course, male. We do not make any hermaphrodism today, okay? But that would be interesting, partially, really. Oh, not a joke. Sometimes you, you might also have hermaphrodism, in, 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 and then what do you see then? Oh, yes. That's, that would be an interesting part. So if somebody wants to make a, a diploma thesis about that, your turn. Okay. Pelvic area, pelvic floor again. We need a rectum. Again, on the second, sacral vertebra with the ampulla running down. Then you have the urinary bladder again. <coughs> and you see the genital plate is really missing over here. Just with the organ over here, this is the prostate. And no, the ureter running down distally or cordially over here. So you see there is a, one important part missing, the entire genital plane is missing. So uterus, vagina, not developed in the male, of course. So what about the peritoneal cavity then? Okay, we need again the abdominal wall, peritoneum pointing distally, and then you see the most caudal part is in between the rectum and the urinary bladder, which means this is the so-called excavatio, Recto vesicalis, and this is the this pouch where you have the liquids uh, located and also visible. And if you turn around again, make a cross section. It's the final image now. Then you have, of course, the bladder first, and the rectum just. Dorsally. And the cavity is in between. So you see that the pouch is still over here, and the rectum is always, always dorsally. But the problem is that ventrally to it, you have one or two organs located in between your probe and the pouch. And that's the only very important part concerning the anatomy. So the pelvic area, it's not, not the problem because if you have the probe over here, you might have this cross section. Okay? So it's nine o'clock, even a little bit later, I think. So anyway, it's absolutely fantastic that first you 
really kept quiet. Might be that you fo have fallen asleep, but <laughs> hopefully not. Uh, I hope I can, I could give you a short overview about also the, the critical points concerning the heart. Uh, but I hope also that you recognize that it's not that easy concerning the topography. Anyway, most important is that you will uh, enjoy the next two days. You will train a lot as much as possible. You take as much as possible with you. And uh, for those who are still a little bit longer over here, um, especially maybe next three years, uh, of course we are dealing again with ultrasound on the, on the limbs uh, in a lecture. If you want to join these, even if you already finished your studies and you still are in, in Graz, you're always invited also to the department. If you have any questions concerning that, if you have any questions also after the meeting, do not hesitate to contact me or, or my colleagues that we might help you. We have a small ultrasound device in our department. It's a very old Methuselix. Uh, it's in Siemens, 20 years old, uh, with three probes. Anyway, we, we try to do a little bit of scans in the department. It's quite working well, but anyway, I hope someday we'll get a better device. Um, for to this evening, I hope you enjoyed it a little bit. Very different approach. And thank you very much for your attention. So, Dr. Feigl, thank you very much for your lecture. And now, are there any questions from the, from the audience here? Someone? Okay, they, are, well, they are all too tired. <laughs> well, I have a question. Long day, yeah. I have a question for someone who is trying to learn like ultrasound for the first time. What um, tool would you think was the, well, the best for learning the anatomy of ultrasound? What would be the best way of, of understanding ultrasound anatomy? Okay, first of all, it's, um, I think as your students, uh, you have no pressure on yourself. And if you are training in the hospitals, uh, like uh, the pre-graduates, uh, and you get the opportunity with a team, like, your st like you students, uh, put the team together and ask to use the ultrasound device over there. And play on your own. Just Scan yourself as much as possible. Uh, you have the first trainings over here and then go into the hospitals and when you have these training months, uh, then try to scan as much as possible on your own. Because if you, if you then post-graduate, you have to pay for it. Very much indeed. And when you're in a hospital and still pre-graduate, it's for free regularly, okay? So this is something and really, Go together, two, three, and then scan yourself as much as possible. This is the training what will be never uh, given back to you otherwise. So it's a very important part. Uh, and with the scanning, well, that's the experience you get. With each day of experience, you're getting better. There's no other, other secret. Same with me. When I started, it was a really major mess disaster, but then it's getting better with each day. Okay. That's my only message for you. Okay. Cross-section anatomy, uh, this is something what you have to repeat, of course, and topographic anatomy too. So that's why you, you should go back also to the anatomy department someday, uh, if you have some free time, and just to think about the different sections. Yeah? Um, an ultrasound atlas is not a very good atlas if there are no C, uh, CD-ROMs or DVDs on. Anyway, it's a living uh, a, a motion view and then it's always the problem that slight changes in the angles of the probe might change your entire anatomical point of view and that's why the problem is with the atlases, for example, they always show the very best view but you, you won't get the very best view on the very beginning. So this is something what you, ha what you have to deal with. And this is something what you have to get your experience on. That's 
that's the only thing. Okay, well then, thank you very much, Dr. Feige. And we have a, like, oh, no. <laughs> a present for you, of course, too. Uh, thank you very much, but this is, you know, <laughs> I'm really happy to be over here. This, uh, thank you very much for the polymer index. <laughs> 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 Okay, great. So this was our last lecture for today, and I hope you enjoyed t the evening, and I hope you're looking forward to finally <laughs> using the ultrasound probes and machines. So for tomorrow, um, we will start with our first lecture at 9 o'clock, so please be here on time. And then, well, the whole team of sona for you and all my colleagues, Johanna and Vanessa, um, well, are happy to have you here and enjoy your weekend with us. Thank you. Thank you.